So I'll uh, yeah, I'll request Professor Ashish to give his uh, introduction of Professor Anus. Welcome, learned professor, researcher, and dear students. COVID-19 is knocking our doors. More than 15,000 persons get infected in last 24 hours in India, which is third highest after Brazil and America. So it is necessary to help our nation to fight against corona. So we have here, first of all, Dr. Anuj Mobai. Anuj Mobai is an applied and computational mathematical scientist whose research is driven by the mathematical modeling of problems of interest to the public health or social science community. He has extensive experience in the health decision analysis and in successful development of a strong mathematical sciences training program. He is an associate director at Precisioner and held faculty position at Simon A. Levin Mathematical Computational Modeling Science Center at the Arizona State University, Temple. He also co-directed Mathematical Theoretical Biology Institute and was earlier associate research scientist at the Prevention Research Center, Berkeley. He is a research member of the National Alliance for Doctoral Studies in the Mathematical Sciences and the Intercollegiate Biomathematics Alliance. So I request Dr. Anuj Mobai to start his talk and uh, I request all participants to give their uh, questions on questions and answer uh, blog. So they can post their questions and Professor Prasad will inform Dr. Anuj Mobai about their questions and he will answer your question. So thank you. So Dr. Anuj Mobai. Anuj, can you share your presentation? Anuj? Yeah. So I will uh, switch off the my video because just uh, to have the better quality of the um, of the presentation. So can you see my um, this thing? Yes. yes. Uh, it's I'm sending live. Yeah. Yeah, it's online now. Okay. Thank you. You can go full screen. Yes. Yeah, we are able to see. Okay. Well, greetings, everyone. Um, good morning, um, Tuesday. Good morning in India, and it is evening here, uh, late evening here in, in US. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, speak. Uh, I was invited by Dr. Prasad, and uh, it, is, it is always I know him for a long time, and this was. Uh, um, I mean, we were ch we chatted on various things in the past, and it's really pleasure um, and as well as honor to to uh, to be part of this um, COVID-19 modeling uh, seminar that he and his collaborators have organized. Um, with that, I would like to first say uh, give my gratitude to Dean Mary Sarrell for uh, for telling me so many things about MI uh, VIT. I was not really aware of. It seems like an amazing institute. I may have to apply for a position there at some point of time. Um, and also um, gratitude to Professor Rushi Kumar as well as Ashish Kumar. But he's, um, they are all um, organizing is not an easy job for especially an event like this one where so many people um, remotely are being joining uh, to this, uh, this webinar. So uh, with that, let me uh, give uh, what I would be talking about today. Um, uh, before I go into the details of it, um, I want to be very clear that I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, I'm not a clinical expert. Um, I'm only a mathematical modeler and help understand disease better and, and study control and evaluations of the control program. So such as social distancing, basically. So uh, my training has been uh, my PhD is in applied mathematics some um, uh, almost more than 10 years ago. Um, I had an experience working in uh, department of infectious disease in a hospital 
Um, I also was part of a clinical trials before. Um, and currently I'm part of uh, organization called as uh, Precision Here, um, where I'm associate director. Um, and I uh, we work on uh, health economics problems and and evaluating um, uh, ev uh, control programs and cost effective ways um, suggesting some of those um, policies basically. So um, with that, I will go further. Um, uh, you know this I was thinking what would be the best uh, strategy to talk today. Um, I just two days ago gave an, uh, another webinar and so kind of uh, out of ideas, but uh, but eventually pulled out together some of the things that is very relevant to COVID-19, but also gives you understanding about how as a modeler we think. Um, and uh, it is very important that um, we discuss and, and, and model it accordingly. So first I will talk about some historical challenges background. Um, I will also talk about um, epidemiological aspects in COVID-19. And then I will talk about some of my studies on modeling COVID-19 uh, aspects, um, eventually ending it um, with future modeling um, challenges and, and limitations. So, um, well, uh, the pandemics have nothing been new to us. Um, maybe in my lifespan, uh, there has been um, now. Uh, Prasad, can you hear me properly or is it uh, from time to time? My connection is not very good. We can hear you. Sir. OK, OK, fantastic. Um, um, uh, there yeah. has been many there has been many pandemics in the past um, and we have learned quite a lot by analyzing data and, and uh, using models uh, what has been successful and what has not been successful in the past. For example, in 1918 Spanish flu, we did not know even about um, the virus uh, that it is spread by influenza virus. Uh, it was spreading by influenza virus. It is uh, usually people used to think it is a, maybe a bacterial infection. Um, it was not until 1933 that, um, that the virus human uh, influenza A virus was isolated in uh, in humans. Uh, so it was very late. Um, one, one of the key features that recently was published almost two decades ago or less than a two decades was published about using data from two different cities, which was one was Philadelphia and the other one was St. Louis. Um, you see on the top right um, of my slide, um, there is a two graph of Philadelphia and St. Louis. Uh, Philadelphia has a very high peak and St. Louis had a very low peak and spread out outbreak. And um, one of the reason that um, the, the people that analyze the data for these two cities um, recognize that the reason that Philadelphia has a high um, and, and a bad outbreak in some sense because they waited uh, two weeks um, after their first case to, to implement the social distancing policies, whereas St. Louis implemented it in two days. Um, so that resulted in something we have been hearing quite a lot in the news. Some is called as flat, uh, flattening the curve. Um, and the flattening the curve is on the right. You are seeing if you implement certain control measures, um, then basically the peak comes down and the curves uh, kind of um, flatten up. And well, but there is an issue here um, that we can't just do implement the social distancing policy uh, and flatten the curve because there is something called as a um, hospital capacity. Uh, because uh, we don't want to overwhelm our hospital capacity and that is a horizontal line and you see the two horizontal dotted lines are there. One is the initial be uh, before an outbreak and slowly and slowly you want to raise that um, health capacity um, uh, of the ho hospitals uh, so that it can handle more cases. Uh, for example, in New York, uh, they had this big area um, conference venue that they converted into hospitals. So they increased the number of beds for the patients of COVID. Um, so so this, this line is actually not a stable. This is fluctuating line. So there's uncertainty associated with it. Um, and this keep on changing a daily on a daily basis and beds are getting added. Um, 
there is a lot of uh, variation in these type of things from city to city. Well, the flattening of curve has uh, now uh, you don't have to. If you have left your health capacity to a previous uh, to COVID level, um, you may have to do a lot more social distancing protective measures than uh, slowly when you in increment your health capacity. Uh, you may relax uh, social distancing uh, and maybe uh, open up the cities, for example. So these are um, these variations. Uh, usually modelers as a modelers, we have to think about not only in terms of a disease outbreak, how many cases, what is the peak and all those things, but also as a level of healthcare capacity that could handle a um, uh, number of cases that are occurring for the COVID outbreak. So um, this is the timeline for the diseases uh, for the COVID outbreak starting from early January. In fact, in China it was in uh, December and uh, some says even in November um, there was a first case reported. Um, but um, we started to see the big news about COVID-19 starting January. And uh, well, as a modeler, what is important is that uncertainty in the in the information has changed. For example, uh, initially we only know a little bit about epidemics characteristics, um, whether it is uh, spreading in clusters or whether it is spreading everywhere or uh, whether there is a asymptomatic cases are spreading it and so on. So, so this information slowly and slowly started to become more uh, widespread and therefore uh, the uncertainty in the epidemic information was reducing, but then there was other information that was coming uh, as far as policies are concerned um, uh, over a period of time that we uh, started to see uncertainty in. So uh, the evolution of information that we use in the models have changed drastically from being uh, more uh, less precise to more precise now um, than before, and there are still many things we don't know about. And uh, and if we model things using those uh, those information, we may be limited by our capacity of modeling methods uh, to draw a reasonable conclusion. So this slide is about evolution of models and evolution of um, uh, information that is used in the mathematical models, for example. Well. I came across this BBC interesting article, actually interesting in some sense, but it's sad in other sense. Um, and it was on, um, and I, I kind of thought over this thing quite a lot. Uh, this was written by a journalist. She's an Indian, um, and she is one of her family member died um, in Gujarat uh, fighting with uh, COVID. And uh, well, she writes about how devastating things have been because it is our system is overwhelmed because there is a fear in the systems and these things are very critical for the models to understand because uh, human behavior plays a very important role in the spread of the diseases. So um, what she says in this article is um, I uh, so as the infection was I mean as his uh, relate uh, her relative was uh, um, uh, his condition was getting bad. Um, uh, she was doing many things uh, and she was a BBC journal journalist, so she's very well known. In fact, she knew many people. In fact, many of the um, um, uh, political readers and other journalists, local journalists in India. So she said, I called hospital after hospital. I was told there was no room, not a single bed in the entire city repeatedly calling helpline got nowhere. Finally, after being admitted one day of his uh, of his ICU intensive care unit, I was able to see him struggling for oxygen in a video call with me. A strong man who was exercised daily and had no health issues. He could never have thought that a virus would land him in in this situation. Well, it is really painful reading this article, but really an eye opener that um, there are hospital settings or healthcare system in, in and it's not about India. It's about whole world I'm talking about. Um, they are being uh, overwhelmed. 
usually in in developing countries like india they have been overcrowded under staff uh, long wait hours because resources are limited um, it's a developing countries not a developed country even in 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 developed country like us um, in uh, new york in spite of being the best city has to face uh, faced many of these challenges um so uh, so there was no ventilators for example in the go there was no communication good communication so now the question comes what as a modelers we can do for that i mean of course we read these stories every day uh, and we become sad and we kind of um, uh, post these things on our social media accounts but what exactly we as a uh, our strength is a mathematical modeler so what can we do basically so um well there is lots of models that are already established by third, uh, mathematical modelers in the past we can use many of those things so for example queuing theory based models have been used for management of hospitals for example so if you see top uh, left corner there is a picture where there is circles and circles donate the hospital settings so this person who is as a patient is coming in to some centralized hotline and asking about where are the beds available you need to um uh, we need to uh, streamline it effectively that they don't die on on waiting to get into line for for getting a bed for example and uh, as happened in this case in bbc uh, bbc article for example so mm, the queuing theory has been amazingly helpful the models using queuing theory here we talk uh, the there is certain inputs that goes in such type of model and it optimizes where an individual should go which hospital individual should go and where is the availability rather than randomly going to the hospitals and and uh, wasting time and and basically making um, risk for the life of a patient basically so just to give you an idea this um, uh, this model has um, input like arrival process for example how many patient arrive in a queue in a given hour what is an average time interval between arrivals uh, does the uh, does that vary the arrival of the people coming to the hospital depends on a time of the day whether it is morning lot of patient coming of the covid whether evening is queuing process how much time patient is waiting suppose you are in the hospital that is a be best availability that you can get uh, how much time you have to wait there to get the bed finally um so these kind of service uh, for example what would be if if the if the who if the hospital is overcrowded how do you decide first come first uh, how do you decide who will get the uh, first um, uh, bed for example so there are there are lots of these inputs that goes in the models and it helps you answer certain output of the model that i have i have it in my um, bottom right um uh, for example it helps you optimize the results over average wait wait per patients uh, how can you reduce average wait patients what percent of time that a healthcare employee or a machine that is used on a patient are being ut utilized you don't want to waste a time just by sitting around where other places a uh, person is dying because there is no machine for example or there is no people to healthcare worker peoples um here also you can talk about capacity raw materials like ppe uh, protective gears for example or ventilators how do you how many you need in a certain location so these things can be done very in, interesting using a queuing, a queuing theory based models and um, behind the scene they are using something called as a little law um which describes the relationship between a uh, number of patients in a system and a mean arrival rate um and uh, and the length of patients remains in the system so how much duration the patient uh, stay in the hospital for example so um very beautiful modeling techniques uh, have been used in a past for a but this it seems like in india we are not using it uh, and in other countries also these modeling techniques we are not using that we can use it for example um okay uh, well another story that i came across in a scroll.in it's an indian story that talks about uh, there was in bhu there is a diagnostic lab there is a institute of medical sciences that's a department of institute of medical sciences in banaras hindu university 
um, and there is a diagnostic lab that is handling 30 million people and for just one test lab is testing for 30 million people. Think about that. That's a huge number of people. One, it's one lab in Eastern UP, Uttar Pradesh. So it seems like we are understaffed. We are uh, the testing facilities are very limited, um, and um, uh, well, in this in this case, they are getting samples every day. A thousand samples they can handle in 48 hours. They take 40 hours also, um, and they they are getting around 1700 samples a day. So uh, well, huge amount of samples they are getting. So they are prone to make an error into it. They are they because they are overwhelmed with the work uh, and they are dealing with a lot more people, uh, a lot more region. Um, they these tests will be prone to lot of error. So how do you model those errors, for example, and what those errors will lead to? How many new cases? How what out what changes it will do to the outbreaks? So I mean there is. Um, so there's a models for imperfect testing on the disease dynamics. You can talk about imperfect testing. Now in this picture that you are seeing here, um, uh, there is one patient that we are following uh, and there, these colored lines indicate different types of test. Uh, well, there is uh, antibodies uh, test, there is antigen test, there is um, uh, there is actual virus detection test. So it depends on what you are testing. Uh, so PCR is a virus detection test. You uh, the um, polymerase chain reaction is the test uh, is the test that that basically uh, identify um, a, a live virus in in the board in the specimen or sample. The only time you can use it if the live virus is is a lot in the body, but as the progression or uh, initially uh, you may not find the vi actual live virus because it is very small amount of virus in the body and the and the test will say no, whereas the test may make a mistake there in identifying. Or later on also after a person has recovered, if you if you do the testing using PCR, you may not be able to find the virus and it will give an error. It will say the virus is not there, whereas the virus is there, but at a very low level. Right then there is another test called as antibody test where antibodies are getting antibody test. You cannot find in the initial stage of the infection because antibodies takes little time to develop in the body. So this test is starts to fail if you do it very early on. Antibody test will not give a correct result. So the question is how do you model and how if you model it, how do you understand the disease dynamics on it basically? So um, well, before I go into the actual model component of imperfect testing on the disease dynamics using these two tests, PCR test and antibody test, uh, we need to understand um, what is the main, how do we, say that the test is creating a bad result, for example. So for example, test. Uh, so if you see this table, uh, this table is showing uh, test being positive and test being negative. If a person is infected, if, if the person is not infected on the columns. So so there were uh, there were total infected. A, uh, their total number of people in the population was N. Out of N, uh, A plus C were infected and B plus D were uh, were not infected. OK, so A plus C plus B plus D is equal to N. That's the total population. OK, so the question here is um, uh, if you apply a test, you can fail to detect or you you identify it correctly. So there are four different choices. The test is saying positive and the person is positive. That means person is infected or the test is positive, but person is not infected or test is negative. That means test is saying not infected, but actually the person is infected. Test is saying not infective, but the person is also not infected. So in two in four of these values, two times you made an error and two times you you made a um, basically a correct decision. So test sensitivity, the any test has something called as tense sensitivity and test specificity. Basically, it captures how many test sensitivity captures 
how many correctly you have identified among all the people who are infected. OK, and test uh, specificity is you, how many correctly you have identified among those without the disease. OK, so this is A and D and divided by total total population in that column, by the way. So these are the two uh, parameters that people use for identifying how bad is the test or how good is the test basically? OK, so there is simple model we can use for it um, is a, a SIR model with a susceptible infected recovered, which is a simple epidemic. And here you can build in virus active tests in infection test. Um, so there are two possible tests, active virus infection test, which is a PCR test and then an antibody test, which is uh, basically testing for antibody. And here um, the testing rate uh, is uh, is basically given by Sigma A and Tau A for active virus and antibodies. You are testing it by Sigma B and Sigma uh, Tau B. And basically it depends on antibodies test. You will not do it in um, in a in a current infection. You will do it in a uh, quarantine people, people who are who are already recovered from the infection there you want to see if you have an antibodies or not whereas active infection test you will do it in a general population because you don't know if they have the so you will do the in unquarantined individual by the way qs qi qr are quarantined individuals here um, and you can build in sensitivity and specificity in the simple models and you can study what happens if there's uh, if the error made by the test varies? Uh, and error could varies because of many different reasons. Uh, uh, because of uh, the test, uh, the raw materials of the test are bad or test handles in a very uh, incorrect way. Um, so these things we can study using a very simple model like this one and study what happens over time uh, if the test efficacy we know is this much. OK, um, and that was happening in the BHU, Banara Sindhu University Diagnostic Test Lab. Um, they were making errors, but we don't know how much of that error is causing the outbreak to grow or, or reduce and over what period of time. And such kind of models can be used very easily um, and to understand this thing. Now again, I'm giving you a broader perspective about the modelings of various relevant features in the community with the proper examples that we are seeing currently rather than just making up something here. OK, um, so this is a very good example and very related to the examples that I gave from the Banaras Hindu University Diagnostic Lab. Now, well, another aspects in the modeling that we face is about definitions. Well, um, I think some of you might be aware of, but um, uh, but this is something came in May 22 news that almost 40 percent, 35 percent, 40 percent cases uh, are being um, uh, don't have a symptoms. And if they don't have a symptoms, how will you know that they are spreading the case? So they are. What is the name we should use for that? Whether we should use uh, latent, whether you use asymptomatic, whether you use pre-symptomatic, what is the no name? And each of these words has a precise definition in the literature. OK, so for example, uh, asymptomatic means people who are not showing symptom, but will never show the symptoms in future also. They will recover without showing symptoms. Uh, in previous uh, diseases, we were we might uh, use this kind of terminology in a different sense, but here asymptomatic is used like a self healing where you don't see the symptom at all. And uh, pre symptomatic are the individuals who are uh, right now asymptomatic. But eventually will going to show the symptoms. And these two folks, these two groups are causing lots of infection in the communities, especially in the COVID case. So definitions are have to be properly modeled in our mod mathematical modeling equation before actually we talk about mathematical analysis, numerical simulation, linking with the data and so on and so forth. 
So um, this is one thing. And I think um, if there will be lots of cases which will not be showing symptoms and is spreading the disease, then the best thing you can do is either not go out at all out of your home, social distancing or wear the face mask. So one could even evaluate the impact of these measures more accurately if you define the terminology in a proper way. So we'll talk about some uh, modeling methods now, and some of you might not have a background in modeling methods for pandemics. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, for an outbreak. There are two basic questions that we talk about: um, contagiousness, that means how fast the disease is spreading in the population, and you might have heard about the uh, the number, which is called reproduction number, that is very common in the in the in the in the in the news articles nowadays. Uh, and then the second one is how violent or how dangerous is the disease? That means how many people dying from the disease? Um, and these are captured by case fatality ratio or mortality rate of some sort. Um, in this table, you see there are different diseases with different reproduction number. Measles has a high reproduction number, um, but not a medium case fatality ratio. Whereas uh, MERS had a very high mort uh, case fatality ratio, but had a very low reproduction number. Low reproduction number, how it is spreading, and uh, case fatality ratio is how uh, deadly it is the disease, basically. Okay, well, this case fatality ratio is very. Why I'm talking about these two metrics? Let me go back actually. Why I'm talking about these things? Well, this is relevant when we talk about a disease like COVID, these two outcomes of your models. If we do not provide these outcomes from your models, then we are giving only partial information about an outbreak. These are critical informations. And besides that, you can do many other things. But I think some of these aspects needs to be incorporated very much in your as an output variables from your models, basically. So case fatality are, is basically a ratio of how many people died divided by how many diagnosed with the disease. OK, now this is a disease. So how many diagnosed with the disease depends on how many you test. Basically, some country are testing quite a lot. Some are not testing very lot. For example, South Korea is testing a lot. And so therefore their case fatality ratio will be very low. Whereas in uh, in uh, US, India and many other countries, it is not as high as uh, in South Korea, for example. So, so that depends on the denominator of the case fatality ratio, which is number of people who are diagnosed. Um, so this metric may not be the best one until unless you can do a uh, zero prevalent, uh, no, not zero, but actual sampling study uh, where you can follow the people uh, and then you can estimate case fatality ratio in the cohort of the samples. Um, so it depends on uh, CFR, depends on uh, surveillance system, testing capability, testing efficacy, uh, but also it depends on who we are testing. So for example, we may not be able to identify asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic cases which are not showing symptoms. So therefore the denominator will decrease. Uh, it could also depend on age. For example, um, uh, some countries, old people are dying quite a lot, whereas some other countries, uh, uh, some other age groups are more dominant. So, um, so age structure matters quite a lot when you are calculating case fatality ratio. Um, uh, so, so these this number is kind of delicate and, and has to be used in a very um, cautiously. Uh, for for the uh, for the outco output variable. So I'm showing in this picture uh, right corner. How is the case fatality ratio is changing over time? Why? Because you are testing now more and more. So as the time is progressing, this is in China in the four different places in China. Wuhan outside of Wuhan outside of Hubei. Hubei is a province or a, a state of a, a Wuhan city um, and China overall. So this has changed over a period of time um, uh, because they were doing more and more testing and therefore denominator is increasing quite a lot. 
so so this numbers is showing inconsistency in the output but again it is the best thing that could measure the fatality uh, some people also use crude mortality rate in the crude mortality rate the denominator is the total population not the total cases diagnosed but the total population and sometimes people use that one to to draw a conclusion but then the number of deaths could be highly uh, under reported also Well, as a modeler, we ask ourselves many things. As the outbreak is going on, we we initially we ask ourselves, how do we prevent? If there are few number of cases, how do we prevent? Like for example, uh, SARS outbreak or not SARS? Sorry, um, yeah, SARS also. SARS didn't become an pandemic like like COVID. Uh, so uh, it 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 is spread, but we were able to prevent its uh, invasion or reinvasion due to many social distancing measures. Uh, SARS outbreak was in 2002, 2003. What is the growth rate of it? How fast it is increasing? The outbreak is increasing. It is very important metrics, and we used many different models for for measuring how fast it is increasing. Okay, this is very very critical, and this could be. Not necessarily for the whole world or for the whole country, but you can talk about your city or your neighborhood, how fast it is growing. And it depends on the local structure of the community. Um, what interventions would be helpful for the population in hand? How drastic intervention we should implement? These all questions are modeled and are captured and asked by uh, as a modelers, so we do it all the time answering this thing and we are doing it for COVID-19 as well. Well, um, before I go into an examples from my research, uh, I need to uh, give some big basic background on the mod, um, uh, this disease models um, to some uh, folks may not have an experience in that. So disease model, basically what you do is you you consider whatever population that you are trying to study the disease in, you divide that population into three compartments, basic three compartments. Uh, susceptibles, people who are not infected. Uh, infectious, people who are infected and infecting others. I compartment and R, people who have recovered from the disease. And then you have the arrow coming from susceptible to I, I to R. And that is called as a transmission. That means new cases. Transmission is the new cases that are becoming becoming from converting from S to I due to infection transmission and recovery. That is um, cases are going from I to R. Now these two arrows are modeled by in a very very different way. What if people are changing their behavior? So transmission rate will decrease or increase. Based on how strictly one is following, uh, people are following social distancing, for example. But in general, uh, these uh, these two um, I compartment, if I look, it is a function of something coming in and something going out, and that something coming in and something going out uh, decides the level of I I compartments. And you see, if we simulate it. The I compartment will look like a red curve in this picture. Okay. So that's a very simple thing. Now these transmission rate uh, could be a function of host population size, contact rates, how fast they are moving, pathogen infectivity, like how bad is the pathogen in transmission itself. So again, um, there is a quantity we call it as a reproduction number average uh, number of new cases that we talked about uh, in a few slides back. Uh, it's basically number of new secondary cases each per infected person is generating in the population. Now, on a, this is an average number of all average it out over all the infected people in the population. But this number is beautiful because it tells you few things. It tells you first, it tells you the ratio of how much is coming in and how much is going out in the I compartment. So is this beta over gamma, how much comes in and how much goes out. So if beta over gamma is greater than one, that means more coming in and less going out, then there will be a peak. That means R naught will be greater than one and there will be a peak. If beta is less than uh, gamma, then there won't be a peak. And you see the top uh, two graphs are showing R naught greater than one and R naught less than one. In the first graph, there is an outbreak or there is an epidemic. 
and in the second graph there is no epidemic. Okay. Um, so this is an epidemic threshold. That's why we call it as an epidemic threshold because it tells you whether there is an outbreak or not. It also tells you how quickly you will rise to the peak. So if you see in this graph on the second uh, third graph um, that uh, higher the value of R naught, the higher the quickly it is rising to the peak. There are different values of R naught that uh, this picture shows and it shows the peak is high and very early on. So it tells you how fast the epidemic is growing also. Um, it also tells you what will be the size of the peak, how many people total will be infected, and it will also tells you what level of immunity or how, what level of control programs we will do in the population to, to control the disease. So there are many, many, many features of this reproduction numbers that we use in defining an outbreak. Well, just to give you an idea here, these are four diseases that I'm comparing, measles, influenza, chicken pox, rubella. And measles has a very high reproduction number and influenza has uh, uh, moderately high, but um, but chickenpox is much higher than influenza and rubella is uh, lower than chickenpox, but higher than influenza. So you see these uh, these graphs that we are seeing on the left side, um, the peaks and the, if, if these type uh, outbreak of these things will come into population, it will show the peaks like this. Assuming everything else the same basically. Now you can make this type of modeling more complex. Uh, for example, recent news that I just heard is that uh, there are you may not be having a permanent immunity of the COVID. You may recover a few, uh, a few uh, a time, a small period of time, and then you become a susceptible to disease. You can get the disease, and in that case. It is not simply SEI model or E stands for hidden infection, asymptomatic, let's say. Um, uh, but the second graph would be more appropriate if you are talking about that you don't get, you may get the infection again. In that case, the recovered compartment would um, come back to the susceptible compartment. OK. Um, um, uh, Prasad, can you t let me know uh, 10 minutes if I'm, I'm uh, before my end period of 10 minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay, Anus, I'll do that. Sure, I thank you. I think you you are now till 20 minutes is there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So um, in this, uh, this, this models, you can make it very complex. For example, you can incorporate T compartment, which is a treatment compartment. Uh, although for COVID, there is no treatment, but the treatment also means providing ventilators, for example. Treatment doesn't mean to only drugs here. So treatment is therapy, some kind of therapy that you are providing. Um, now, uh, so how do we model? Which models we should use? Of course, it depends on a research question in hand, but it also varies upon what shape we are trying to um, imitate. So if you see on the bottom right corner, uh, it is showing a different shape based on what you incorporate in the model. So what we are seeing right now in the COVID is, is a third situation, which is a um, we are expecting the second wave in some countries, by the way. In India, it is still a first phase, but second countries, uh, there are countries which are expecting the second phase right now. So it, it could be the last figure that would be a better to model that way rather than uh, first two figures, for example. Um, well, as a modeler, what do we do? I mean, I think some of the us uh, do these things so regularly, but we never discuss. We never discuss about it. Uh, as an, there is lots of uncertainty in our task, basically. So precisions, uh, uh, precisely what we do is these five things as a modelers. First is identifying the sources of the mechanism. That means we have to know the research questions. We have to know what are the factors that are driving the research questions. And that may be critical to the dynamics. So 30% of our work uh, time goes, efforts goes in the just identifying those source. Uh, and then incorporating those source in the mathematical models, 10% roughly. That's very, very small amount as compared to identifying the source of mechanisms. 
well performing the mathematical analysis and statistics is also um, well it these are not uh, 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 absolute numbers these are variable number but approximately uh, 20% of the effort goes in mathematical uh, because we are used to doing these mathematical analysis and then interpreting the results interpreting the results takes a huge deals of information and connecting it back to the uh, first point which is ident uh, mechanisms and that takes 50% of the and eventually we need to validate the results using an alternative source of who says that our results are correct you have to find a ways to to identify how do you validate these things so that these process we do it now and then but the the amount of percentage um according to me it should be like this distribution the so 30% in the top one and the 25% in the bottom one are the most important time that we are spending in in understanding our mathematical models um there are different reproduction numbers that we talk about uh, in the literature there is lots of uncertain aspects there is confusions because people use left and right reproduction numbers but the meaning of it is very very different um so the basic reproduction numbers that i talked about is only at the starting of an epidemic or starting of an outbreak effective reproduction numbers is a time dependent and you can talk about any time uh, control reproduction number only you talk about when the interventions or the controls or some kind of like face mask social distancing is already there in the population then you talk about control reproduction numbers and type reproduction numbers when you might have a different type of people right for example you could have age group so you can talk about uh, old old type reproduction numbers versus young type so how many old people are infecting and how many young people are infecting for example so that is called as a type reproduction number now invasion reproduction number is also there that is uh, uh, that is when there is multiple strains so suppose uh, covid uh, pathogen strain mutate and there are maybe two three uh, strains of it circulates in the population in that case you will model uh, those multiple strains in dengue for example there are four strains uh, and people model is there you talk about when one strain is there what is the reproduction number of other strains to invade so there are many of these reproduction numbers that there are other reproduction number but these are uh, important ones and so i listed it here and so there should not be a confusion we should always ask her people use reproduction number but which one you are talking about and it will the meaning will change and the measurement of that will change as well um now lately we have been hearing something like a herd immunity and the, the one of the examples of the um uh, of the covid comes into mind is a sweden sweden is actually uh, doing something called as they are trying to achieve a herd immunity and that's why they didn't ask they didn't do any kind of lockdown and they let people do everything except they said okay you have to be careful don't be too close it was it was really in informal uh, ways that they are kind of pressing forward to that well a recent study uh, so if there is a question no yes. we can continue and uh, there are 10 more minutes are left for you okay okay a uh, study showed 6.6% uh, sweden population has has antibodies only till late may and actually 60% is assumed to be um uh, herd immunity herd immunity means that you should have sufficient number of immune people in the population that infected person when they go out they don't get, get enough of people uh, susceptible people around them to infect others and so some people are providing immunity to other people and that is what is called as a herd immunity so it is believed that 60% people have to be immune in order to to be herd immunity well it is uh, it is calculated in a very very simple way it is calculated using r effective effective reproduction number and if the effective reproduction number is less than 1 that means you are not growing um, uh, the cases are not growing each case is not replacing him him or herself 
basically. So it is our effective or effective reproduction number is R naught basic reproduction number times the ratio. How many people are susceptible fraction of people who are susceptible? And if this number is less than one, then you find out proportion of susceptibles that needs uh, to be uh, if you if you make this thing less than one, you can compute something called as a herd immunity. Very simple idea. And we are talking very fancy way, but it is computed in a very, very simple way. How uh, herd immunity in, in this thing. So anyway, uh, and as soon as the herd immunity goes up, our effective number goes up. Uh, there is an uh, there is a second wave. Uh, there is a risk of second wave coming back basically. So uh, let me talk about uh, some contact tracing um, modeling. Uh, you know, the question is we don't have a treatment. We don't have a vaccination. So what can we do? Well, contact tracing is the one of the best methods, um, but there is a meaning for it. Um, the people use word quarantining when they are uh, basically um, Isolation is another opposite of quarantine. Both way you are restricted uh, some way. Uh, quarantine is more voluntary, whereas isolation is forceful that you are asked to be remain inside. And basically what you do is if you are infected, you basically uh, if they identify the person is infected, they trace the contacts. So how do you model these things? Basically, you can model something like that. If there is a model like SEIR, and uh, basically forced is an isolation. Q3 is an isolation and Q1 and Q2 is quarantine because you don't know in Q1 and Q2 who whether they have a symptoms or not. They don't from their face. They don't have a symptoms, whereas I is showing the symptoms and therefore you are isolating it forcefully. OK, so um, so Q1, Q2 is quarantine and Q3 is isolation here. Um, and you can model this thing very beautifully contact tracing, even though contact tracing is an individual behavior, but you can model it. So for example, contact tracing you can say is uh, fixed deficiency. So if you if if I if you see my second point bullet here, um, which is basically capturing how many people from S to Q when you are taking out and E to Q2 you are taking out, there is K of times. K times you are doing more for susceptibles than for exposed class. So that means you are you are somehow quarantining K people more. So if K is equal to zero, if K is equal to zero, perfect efficiency of tracing. That means everyone who is infected, you are isolating only those or you are quarantining only the cases which are infected. But people, um, but if K is equal to one, uh, K is equal to big number, uh, uh, maybe 50 or 100, then you are basically wasting your efficiency resources. Efficiency is not very good for contact tracing. So beautifully it is done in a very simple way how the contact tracing could be done. But anyway, uh, I mean, you can talk about cost here. You can model cost associated with it, different types of cost, public health cost, societal cost direct cost, indirect cost, cost to an individual. We can model all these things very, very cheap, uh, cheaply. And there are methods to do that. And um, uh, this is one of my paper in the past where we model cost associated with quarantining and isolations uh, when the, the tra contact tracing efficiency is there basically. Um, well, the result is there. What is the training efficiency and how much will be the cost? It is not always more contact tracing, the always the better. There is a threshold in that uh, and that would be needed for controlling the uh, disease, which will be cheaper as well as it will control the disease. Uh, well, there is another studies. Um, Prasad, I have five minutes or, or I'm out five of minutes. minutes. Five minutes. OK, thank you. I will be done with that promise. Well, uh, you know, recently there was a there was a news actually about Delta Airlines um, changing their policy of boarding. Um, in US, there are planes, they are boarded, people aboard the planes by zone wise and um, and they they take zone one, zone two, zone three, zone one, zone two. They have decided it based on optimizing uh, their their time. Uh, the time is the money for the airlines, so they have done it based on um, their making so fast so that people can go fast and and therefore we can save money. I mean the airlines can save money. 
but that policy may not be true for for an outbreak if the outbreak is spreading for example so recently delta changed it uh, in fact delta american many airlines changed it from back to front that means back row comes first and then the next row uh, from the back and then the first row in the very end basically so the question is instead of uh, doing the zone wise which used to be the case now they are doing is back to front row wise is this a good policy or they just made it a random decision well it turns out um, by the way it spreads in the it, it is very much likely to spread in a because it is a airborne and asymptomatic can spread it basically so it is very much through the air travel so this is the question that we had whether their policies are better or not in the plane so we developed these models where basically which we are capturing is probability uh, these are individuals in the plane think about um, people who are entering the plane and they are susceptible they are some infective and they are they are coming in co close contact with each other and the contacts here defined as uh, the radius of infection as well as duration of the contacts how long they are next to you basically and basically you can model something like that and uh, we did some of these thing with a uh, huge simulations and we found out the policies that delta and american airlines are doing are actually counterintuitive they are causing more harm than good in fact um, it is better for them to go back to the previous policy and we just this paper is actually in the review right now um, but it causes lots of uncertainty in that and uh, um, and uh, and this is the way the modeling has been extremely helpful. So with that, let me uh, stop here. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope I have motivated enough to provide some basic idea about how we do the modeling, what aspects are critical, how do we relate it to the real life aspects of it rather than just the theoretical aspects of it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Anus. Uh, there are a few few questions from the participants okay. yeah uh, hope you are able to hear me yes i can loud and yeah. clear uh, there is somebody is asking that how china recovered so fast how what say, say how me. china recovered so fast how china recovered so fast well yeah. it it will be too early to say recovered because china has um, has an outbreak coming uh, reporting i mean i just read in the newspaper that um, that there will be a, uh, this beijing is infected uh, is reporting very high number of cases by the way and they are closing down all the cities and 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 the um, and they are doing the similar type of intervention as wuhan by the way so i i don't think that is it is recovered um, uh, but as i said before they might have crossed the first wave uh, the second wave is uh, is is um, is going on right now in china by the way it's starting to okay and uh, there is one more question from one more person uh, is saying that uh, some of your models show that there is permanent immunity in covid 19 case is it so yeah so if you see my title was uncertainty and precision so well, uh, we did not up till recently. We did not know that is it a permanent recovery or is it a temporary recovery? Well, we still don't know very clearly whether temporary recovery is the right way to go forward with the COVID or not. But as far as the past experience on a coronavirus and influenza strain is concerned, for that particular strain, you could uh, you might have uh, you make once you get it, you get permanent immunity. So, so again, it, this is this is what my title was: uncertainty and precision. There are so many uncertainty. Maybe in months to come, we will there will be more studies where more, we will make a more precise guess, uh, a more precise answer that okay, there is no permanent immunity, for example, in that, and then we will change our models. But right now, this is the best knowledge we have. Okay. Uh, there is two more questions and one is uh, some of your models doesn't include a SER type models only SAR like that only why it is so well uh, the models that i showed were uh, for sir was uh, just to show uh, just to build up the theory there and uh, well you are absolutely correct that as i said the definition of asymptomatic and presymptomatic very very important 
and most of my models right now have been having those type of things although i didn't showed all this uh, all the studies but in the plane also i wanted to give an idea about how we are modeling it rather than exactly what we are modeling we do have asymptomatic and presymptomatic stages but again when we are talking about airplane for example the duration is two hours it's not the community that we are talking about in community people live for for good number of uh, days basically but in flight you live stay there for few hours so here the differentiation of asymptomatic presymptomatic really doesn't matter too much okay so it depends on what is your my research questions that uh, we could uh, we could force, focus our attention to yeah okay uh, this is question from my side uh, sure. how how to validate the models of pandemic such as covid 19 we do we yeah. have a lot of different different data is coming from our side yeah well uh, you know uh, there are uh, you know usually in the field people use it half the data if you have 100% data you use half the data for estimating parameter and another half for validating your work okay so now what will be your half in this case well suppose you have incidence data like number of new cases that are coming to the hospitals time series data that you can use it for estimating parameter and then you can use a mortality incidence how many people dying to estimate uh, to validate your model whether that is uh, um, making sense or not so usually you have to uh, do have to have some alternative well right now people are also using um, cell phone data so how people are moving how people are following a social distancing for example so these apps we use all these apps and these apps once we use it they go they report to some some collection agency and they we have these data that we are using to identify how people are moving in social distancing for example so those type of data also we could use it right so there are different data sets that one could use it one has to use in order to well you cannot use the same one basically as you are using it for parameter estimation okay uh, i think uh, two more quick questions uh, somebody is asking that is it possible to share your ppt i think it is a recording you will going to yeah, post or? yeah yeah recording i post it yeah so they will have all these things okay and one more quick question how to manage the economical aspects with the mathematical modeling during an outbreak well uh, i showed one example of uh, taking into a, see when we say economic uh, what do we mean by that i mean economic for who for, for we cannot do everything basically it's it's a, it's a human mind can understand only limited information the reality is very complex and so we need to be focused on for example i showed in my slide different types of cost cost to the individual cost to the public health cost to the society right productivity cost productivity is if i am sick i don't go to the work um that is a cost there is a money dollars amount that i am not earning for example so that is a cost so what we are measuring it first of all and again the same way that i showed i mean you can find out average one uh, person cost of doing something and then multiplied using your epidemic model how many people are showing those um those type of things and then you multiply that unit price with the with the total number of people who are infected so that will give you a total cost for example so yeah i think um yeah. Dean mary farrell also has a question i saw her hand raised yes 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 so thank you i was just waiting for all the mathematical related questions to be asked in jen first of all and thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and uh, can you share any uh, case studies in which the mathematical modeling was successful so far in any of the viral infections was there any case studies on this because we normally don't see the mathematical modeling when we are working yeah. on uh, chemical experiments so can you share with us any success stories of this mathematical modeling and how far it was useful in the past yeah well there are many actually not one or two there are many 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 study that has been successful um well in hiv for example the whole field has been very successful because of 
because of mathematical modeling tools because hiv is a long term disease and there is hidden uh, people do not come social stigma is attached to it and people don't come up forward to it there is many ways uh, for example when we run this thing how many drug resistance cases will be there so uh, of the uh, so you know they use these um um treatment for hiv for for pre exposure prophylaxis which is like a vaccine for hiv which is given to the vulnerable population and well if you give lot of treatment in the um, in the population how do you trade off i mean the benefit is you are giving more treatment in the population but then you are causing more drug resistance cases also because you are pressuring the population with lots of treatment so there is a trade off what is that threshold and we have seen it in some population who has not built a models their cases has been a huge as compared to some places and uh, we have done studies in south africa for examples um in covid also now one thing i want to this is actually a very good question you asked um one thing i want to say here is if we are talking about projection okay how many cases will be tomorrow or day after tomorrow or 10 i think there is not many studies but if you are trying to understand which group i should uh, uh, where should i find the clusters of the cases in delhi they are doing they are finding identifying clusters using models also by because what happens is the case might have reported in this neighborhood but got infected somewhere else so this may not be the high risk area and if you do just by clinical study you may identify this as an is a uh, high risk area but the high risk is this area where the person got infected okay so these things identification of the right clusters delhi in delhi they are doing something like that using mathematical models for examples and uh, and i think other areas also there people have done it in a how the system work is the role of a mathematical not not really by as a projection not necessarily how many cases will be there or how many deaths will be there that is weaker things to project because there is so many uncertainty but you can understand what drives the system what aspects of the models are are, are changing the system's behavior basically that you can understand okay thank you so much sir i think uh, this is a yeah. more informative presentation by you and i would like to address the question what you have asked me in the beginning and uh, i think uh, first time uh, i mean we are in contact and uh, you are in bit uh, i mean virtually and uh, i would like to extend my invitation to you to come to the campus and you can visit us and you can join with our speakers i mean the organizers here who is known to you so we would like to have collaborations with you and uh, maybe it can be a joint proposals or joint publications and also you can be the visiting professors so uh, we will be very much happy to have you and uh, my invitation is to all the speakers uh, present here so i'm uh, welcoming all of you to visit campus when the situation is becoming all right and probably after september or october i think mathematics department is uh, planning for one big conference uh, which is Uh, in association with mathematical society of india so if uh, everything is uh, getting all right uh, we may be having you in person otherwise again uh, <laughs> looking forward to meet you in virtual mode in the month of december so thank you all and yeah. once again i would like to thank the speakers so well let I'd me like let me say one thing actually very quickly sorry uh, prasad you know no, okay, I, okay. i showed uh, an example of um, this airplane models where the boarding policy uh, we are suggesting a boarding policy which is very good for it and that's a very good example of of what you, the question you were asking that is practically being used right now in, in decision making policy for example so i think the reason we are making it so that we can quickly come to the uh, vit conference and give some uh, talks there as well and meet folks so thank you for your invitation thank you thank, thank you anish yeah. bye yeah so i will i will uh, drop Uh, right now because it's too late yeah. in the night yes right? yes thank you anish thank you for your uh, uh, time i know it's very late night for you That's thank fine. you for your invitation and uh, there are few more questions maybe i'll send you mail and we can get back to you and i i can contact them the answer so i can send them back sure it's my okay. pleasure and thank you for inviting me all of you it's very very kind of you all to invite me for this it's honor thank you yeah thank you bye okay so